Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorio. So what am I doing standing here in all these silly clothes? Well, very simply, I'm here to talk a little bit about the equipment of an average level, let's say mid to late 15th century medieval soldier that you might find in England or France, for example. And what you can see I'm wearing at the moment is very simply a male shirt. Uh, it's short sleeved, finishes more or less at the elbows in this case. Um, and it goes down to my mid thigh. It's riveted mail, chain mail, as some people call it, over the top of an arming jacket of sorts, otherwise sometimes known as an acaton or a gambeson. And I've got a salé on my head, in this case with a movable visor. Some salés, as I've spoken about in previous videos, don't have movable visors. But this is a minor detail. There were various types of helmet. Um, the salé, or salet, as some people call it, it was a very particular, um, particularly popular type of helmet for a lot of different types of medieval soldiers in the late 15th century, from archers all the way up to mounted knights. Now, it's quite obvious that I'm not fully equipped here, uh, and what I'm going to be talking about is what goes over this. So, it's very common if we look at artistic sources and indeed documentary accounts in the late 15th century to see that a standard uh, sort of um, town militia type soldier or a uh, type of retinue that might follow a lord around, might follow a knight around, would very often have this sort of level of equipment. That is, they would have an arming jacket, i.e. a padded jacket of some kind on their torso. They'd usually have nothing on their legs at all. I've, uh, I've just looked at my legs up there. I've just got medieval hose on my legs. I've got shoes or boots on my feet. Um, and really they'd only, for the most part, for economic reasons, protect their torsos and their heads. These being the most vital things, of course, to protect from missile weapons and all sorts of other things. Common, you know, stabs in hand-to-hand -hand combat, this type of thing. However, by the late 15th century, the mail shirt alone was, generally speaking, not regarded as enough protection against the weapons of the time, even for a common soldier. So it's actually very rare that we see in late 15th century art a soldier such as an archer or a billman or a spearman wearing only a mail shirt. So what we're going to look at now is we know what I've got on my head, we know what I've got on my body up to this point, and we're going to look at what generally goes over this, namely a brigandine. So, what is a brigandine? Well, very simply, it's a development of the coat of plates. In the 14th century, it was very common for men-at-arms, aka knights, to have on their torso something known as the coat of plates, which was an assemblage of the plates of varying sizes, riveted to the inside of a cloth or leather garment. As we get to the year 1400, we're looking at about 1380-1390, it became more and more common for those people, the people with the best armour, to have one-piece solid breastplates, or at least coat of plates made of fewer, larger plates, as it became more possible for them to afford larger plates, such as breastplates, what became breastplates. And once we get past the year 1400, we actually see a divergence between the sort of knightly torso armours, which involved less, less number of plates, but a bigger size of those plates, into the, the typical uh, cuirass that we see on later so-called all-white um, knights. So we've got a, a breastplate, a backplate, and then an articulated fold around the skirt. Um, and in the other direction, for other types of soldier, and it must be said sometimes for men-at-arms and knights as well, we see instead of um, fewer, larger plates, we actually see more plates, but them becoming smaller. And that ultimately develops into the brigandine. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this brigandine up close to you so you can see, first of all, the inside of it. So you'll see the inside is arranged of lots of overlapping plates. There we go, as the exposure adjusts. Um, on all sides, so that's the back you're currently looking at, and that's what will become the front in there. And you can actually see the slightly larger plate over the breast there to protect the, essentially, the ribs. Now what's notable about these armours that are meant for more common soldiers is, of course, a knight or a man-at-arms, generally speaking, has retainers who help get him dressed. So very often, knightly armour um, closes, or opens, depending how you look at it, at the back. Whereas um, common soldier's armour very often closes at the front, as is the case with this brigandine. Now, I should mention, first off, 
This is modelled on um, an actual brigandine in the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Um, so it is based on a historical original and it's a relatively close um, copy. And you'll see that with a little bit of wiggling and wriggling, I can just about get it on myself. Obviously all armour pretty much is easier to put on when you're doing it with assistance and this is no difference. However, as you'll see, it does have straps and buckles. So I can slowly work my way up connecting each of those straps and buckles. So while I do that, I'm gonna do an edit so that you don't have to watch me do all of these and then we'll look at the armor once I've got it on. So there we have it, the Brigandine is now on. As you can see, I'm completely encapsulated now in, in this case, hardened spring steel plates, back and front on my torso. And you can see that the general shape of the Brigandine is not dissimilar to the breastplate and fold that we see on men-at-arms and knightly effigies. That is, the breast is slightly domed like this. I've got hard plates here uh, to protect the most vital organs inside my torso. And, um, but I've got better mobility, generally speaking. Although it's, it's not, you know, don't think about it as being as flexible as male. It is not, it is still made up of plates. However, I must say this is new and I'm sure it will get slightly more flexible with use. But the mobility is definitely better than my breastplate and fold um, that I have. And it's not quite as hot um, and it's generally speaking a little bit more comfortable. So it is a good armour. Is it as protective as a breastplate and backplate and fold? Um, generally speaking, no, because of course, while you have the benefit of the flexible plates that can articulate more than the breastplate and backplate, that doesn't give you such a rigid shell-like defence. So if, for example, I was struck by something heavy, um, such as a lance at high speed, or indeed came off of a horse, or this kind of stuff, it doesn't support my rib cage and my internal organs as well as a solid breastplate and backplate do. However, by compromising that little bit of rigid defence, of course, I gain in mobility because I'm not so rigid. So it's a it's a, a positives and negatives thing, just as with most things in uh, when we're talking about weapons or armour. Just to reiterate this, what you're now looking at, so sale, mail shirt, brigandine over the top, and then essentially nothing on my arms and legs apart from clothes, maybe some padding on my arms, is a very, very typical uh, level of defence that we see worn by lots of common soldiers. When I see common soldiers, I mean things like billmen and archers and crossbowmen. Um, a very common level of um, armour that we see in the mid to late 15th century and indeed into the 16th century as well. So this is quite indicative of the type of equipment that lots of people would have been fighting in in the period in which we're studying the, uh, the fencing treatises of when we're looking at medieval fencing traditions. Now um, it is hot, it is a hot day outside, I think it's a probably about 27 degrees outside today which for England as I'm sure you'll appreciate is pretty hot. Um, where I am here, which is my garden room, essentially a large shed, is particularly hot. I think it's probably about 32 degrees in here. Am I sweating? Yes, I'm sweating quite a lot. I'm quite hot. Am I uncomfortable? No, I'm not uncomfortable at all. Is it heavy? Relatively, yes. Funnily enough, most of the weight comes from the male shirt underneath. Um, however, the brigandine itself is not light. We're talking about one, milli one millimeter hardened steel plates all over. Now one millimetre, you might think that's quite thin, but actually when you consider the amount of steel that I'm covered by, actually that adds up to quite a bit. So the combination of brigandine and mail is actually relatively heavy. Um, and it's comparable really to what a knight or a man at arms is wearing on their torso. Um, but of course they're wearing arms and legs armour as well. Now in terms of wearing leg armour, that doesn't really add much to your noticeable weight carrying because it's, it's stuck to your legs. Once you start to add larger helmets, pauldrons, arm armour, that does add quite a lot of weight to your, to your spine and what you feel that you're carrying. So it is relatively heavy, however you can still move quite quickly in it and I could fence quite happily in this gear. The main constricting factor that I'm going to experience is heat. 
I'm gonna, I'm, I do get very, very hot in this gear. And of course, a lot of that heat is made up from the padding. So any of you who do HEMA, you think about the jackets you wear in sparring, it's that jacket plus stuff over the top. Now, the mail, of course, doesn't really add anything to your, uh, to how hot you are because heat can tra easily transfer in and out of that mail shirt. However, it does add to the weight that you're carrying. And as soon as you start adding plate defenses, plate defenses prevent the amount of heat exchange that's possible from your body so that you get a build-up of heat underneath those plates. So yes, armour does um, definitely change how you fight. Obviously, if someone wants to stab me now, um, they're going to have to aim at very specific parts. If they stab with any kind of conventional weapon, such as a sword or a dagger, into my chest, essentially they stand practically zero chance of getting through it. I've got hardened steel plates, mail under that, padding under that. So I'm essentially invulnerable, more or less, except to very powerful things, perhaps like the most powerful bows, crossbows and lances. I'm more or less invulnerable on my torso. However, my arms and legs, for reasons of mobility, I might be wanting to operate a bow or use uh, halberds or um, just operate siege machinery or climb up ladders, all this kind of stuff, or dig holes even, things that common soldiers have to do. My arms and legs are um, uncovered, more or less. Um, so I am more vulnerable in those parts. It should be mentioned that sometimes common soldiers, definitely if we look at Froissart's Chronicles for example, are seen wearing arm armour or leg armour, or sometimes one or the other, sometimes both. So there were common soldiers such as crossbowmen, even archers, who sometimes wore even more armour than I'm currently wearing. And it surprises some people that um, late 15th century art not uncommonly shows archers wearing leg armour in addition to all of what I'm wearing here. So they really were looking at armouring people quite heavily. People weren't disposable, um, populations were relatively low and soldiers, particularly trained soldiers, were a valuable commodity. You didn't want to be losing them on campaign. So they protected them as best as they could afford to do. And really a soldier wearing this level of kit is now quite hard to kill. Um, and, you know, d as we all know, disease was the biggest killer of, of soldiers on campaign. It wasn't actually enemy weapons. So there we go. I'm going to sum up there. I'm sure I'll talk more about the brigandine and armour in general a lot more in future videos. But that, I hope, gives you an idea of the sort of level and equipment um, that a common-ish soldier, at least in Western Europe, would have been wearing in the late 15th century and indeed into the 16th century. A very common combination. Male shirt, brigandine, salé. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.